Hello, everyone. My name is Annie Reyes, and we're pleased that you could join us for the first lecture uh, in volume four of our 12 week no neuropsychology didactic series. Next slide, please. These lecture series brings you um, lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. Next slide. The series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists to provide free high quality didactic opportunities. Next slide, please. And we would like to thank our sponsor for their financial support for the series. Next slide. Before we start, here are some disclaimers about the series. This training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology and the views of the speakers are their own. Next slide. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box on the lower left of your screen and a recording of today's lecture will be provided in our website later the week, in the week. Next slide. And now it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Jennifer Manley for today's lecture titled Population Neuropsychology Community Center Brain Health Research. Dr. Jennifer Manley is a professor of neuropsychology and neurology at the Gertrude H. Sierkiewski Center and the Tapp Institute for Research and Aging and Alzheimer's Disease at Columbia University. She completed her graduate training in neuropsychology at the SESU UC San Diego Joint Doctoral Program. After a clinical internship at Brown University, she completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Columbia University. Dr. Manley aims to improve the diagnostic accuracy of neuropsychological tests when used to detect cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease among African-American and Hispanic elders. This work clarifies the independent influences of language, acculturation, education experiences, racial socialization, and socioeconomic status and cognitive test performance with the ultimate goal of understanding more about the relationship between culture and cognition. Her research on cultural, medical, and genetic predictors of cognitive aging and Alzheimer's disease among African Americans and Hispanics has been funded by the National Institute of on Aging and the Alzheimer's Association. She has authored over 100 peer reviewed publications in eight chapters and has received several awards for her scientific contributions, her advocacy, mentoring, and professional service. And it is our honor to have Dr. Manley speak to us and kicking off our volume fours. Thank you, Josh. Well, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And um, I'm really honored to be a part of this, this really um, you know, incredible series. So um, uh, I'm gonna give a brief talk. It's not gonna take the whole hour. So I really look forward to the discussion afterwards. I hope everyone um, can really, you know, listen up and, and be engaged and ask me hard questions and we'll, we'll get the conversation going. Um, uh, you know, you might recognize some sort of concepts from the INS plenary that I did in February. Um, I gave a talk at the Alzheimer's Association Health Disparities Conference that um, also sort of, um, you know, touched on some of these ideas. So there is some, um, you know, maybe new content that I've been thinking about, but um, I really wanted to um, make this a, uh, you know, a talk that um, has a lot of room for, and uh, I know that this talk has a lot of room for improvement. So I'm eager to hear from each of you um, as we go along in our, in our conversation. Um, so um, first thing I wanna do is, um, is thank the people that I work with. Um, you know, now you can see clearly these pictures are way more than 18 months old um, because we're not wearing masks and we're not socially distancing, but um, we need to update our, our lab pictures and it's only gotten, I think, um, you know, growing even more and getting more exciting, but um, there's a number of, of grants that also fund the work, um, some of the work that I'll be talking about today. So the overview of, of the talk is, um, is, um, is uh, here. Um, I, I'm going to try to make the case that um, we have already um, uh, identified um, some of the um, reasons 
why in neuropsychology we know very little about people who are not white and about people who are not well educated, people who um, have lower income, um, people who are traditionally underrepresented and um, uh, and and excluded from from neuropsychological research, and yet um, experience um, a higher um, prevalence uh, or higher risk of of brain health. Uh, disparities. Um, and I think we know why. Already there are these gaps in knowledge. Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about what I think some of them are. We actually have the tools that we need, um, in part borrowing from other disciplines and in part kind of taking advantage of the strengths that we already have as psychologists and as neuropsychologists to create a more inclusive and relevant field. Um, and part of that is really kind of centering ourselves as a, as a public health discipline, um, which I don't think um, we're really trained as. Um, we're often kind of coming out of uh, psychology or psychiatry or neurology um, departments. And um, it's not so much, uh, you know, we're not really seen as a, as a public health field, but I think that, um, re-centering um, ourselves in that direction is probably where we need to go in order to become a more relevant field. Um, and um, then I'll, I'll sort of, you know, very selectively um, review a couple of key factors that I think come up in brain health research when uh, we're conducting community-centered neuropsychology. Um, I see that some chats are coming up, but I can't actually see them. So if anybody wants is telling, trying to tell me something, you actually have to unmute yourself and say it. Um, otherwise, I'll just I'll just continue on. Um, so here are some things that I think are are facts. I put the hashtag there because they're there. I I don't provide any references, but here here are my here are my things that I think are sort of facts on the ground. Um, which is that um, the infrastructure that supports our field um, is deeply inequitable. And that's because really we've been, um, uh, you know, assuming that uh, the people who come to see neuropsychologists and who um, are available for neuropsychological research and who um, get neuropsychological services are uh, well-connected um, they have no problem getting to the hospital or to our offices. Um, you know, patients who uh, may not have capacity to consent um, or uh, people who are having a hard time, um, you know, um, getting to appointments and things like that. Um, they have partners um, who will help them. They have family members or uh, paid um, caregivers who will, who will help them from place to place. Um, they're well-educated and are well-insured um, and English-speaking. Um, and so, you know, I think this is just part of the assumption that's built into our, our field. Uh, and this kind of, um, you know, is the source of these inequalities and inequities in, um, in whether, you know, we have um, uh, tools that are um, capable of, of making accurate um, diagnoses and um, actually measuring cognition properly and whether um, the way that we design our, our research and our clinical work um, is, um, is actually, um, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, I just heard something that's like a glass shatter in the background. I think my kids broke something, but anyway, somebody's going to be somebody's going to cleaning up glass. Um, that should be fun. Um, so, so um, uh, our clinical work, I think, is directed towards a very narrow, um, heterogeneous group of people. Um, so, um, the. I think that we need more resources to support um, the, the infrastructure that will make things more accessible. And those resources actually, you know, we need to be able to adapt them on the fly. So um, uh, I think that's just, you know, you can't always anticipate what you're getting into. And so adaptability is key. 
and then um, I, I think that it's pretty clear, um, you know, we've seen a lot of this reflected in the way that um, COVID has hit um, uh, disproportionately um, some populations in some neighborhoods and vaccines, the way that vaccines were rolled out um, dis inequitably across neighborhoods, that um, these same policies that, um, that created um, the, are the root of those health inequalities are also the root of brain health um, inequalities. So um, the next step for this is actually changing policy and neuropsychologists have a role in that, in that advocacy for our, for our participants and for our patients. Um, how did we get as a field, as a neuropsychological field, how did we get to um, such an inequitable place? And I think that it's by centering whiteness. We centered people who already have access and who can pay. We didn't question the universals of our um, uh, you know, neuropsychological theories about how cognition works and how development works. And um, we, we really um, used convenience um, sampling or convenience recruitment for our research. And that um, gave us a very biased view of um, the diseases and the brain structures and and functions and development that we're studying. Um, we relied, uh, I think, it, as a part of this convenience-based um, recruitment on participant registries, even those that are online are supposed to be more you know, democratic or accessible. Um, having an online registry just really does not make it more um, accessible to most people. Um, uh, we uh, include, um, uh, uh, you know, inclusion or exclusion criteria in our um, in our research that um, disproportionately excludes people who are um, uh, members of populations that experience brain health disparities, and I listed some of them there. Um, as scientists, we assume that we're the ones who um, are best are you know best know what the um, what the people need. Uh, we usually decide they need more education about the, the disease, but I think that that's really um, often wrong. Um, and we're the ones who need to be in the learning space. Um, so we need to, to take a real, um, you know, a, a more humble approach, a more community-based approach. Um, way back when, I should have the, the year for this, um, for this publication, it's probably 20 years ago, but uh, a really um, awesome researcher at the University of, um, uh, Indiana University uh, named um, Chris Callahan uh, did a study where uh, he screened everyone in a primary care, care clinic cognitive screening. And um, there's a high number of African-Americans in that group. And he offered as a, as a function of that screen, he offered people um, like a free, um, you know, free neuropsych exam if they scored low. And um, barely anybody took him up on it. Um, and this was like really a, really a shock because he had assumed that the reason why, um, you know, the neuropsych um, clinics and the neurology clinics weren't full of, um, of black people um, was because there was, uh, they, they didn't have access to it. But, um, you know, he basically made that access, um, you know, opened up that access and, um, and they didn't flow in. So um, basically that paper is classic um, I should, really should have the, 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 the year there. I'll, I'll email it or tweet it or something. Um, I'd love to get some updates on that type of work um, that sort of pits access against, um, you know, uh, other, other potential barriers. But I think, again, um, you know, we, we as neuropsychologists need to recognize it's not always... Um, you know, what we expect the, um, the barrier to be might not actually be, be the main, main problem. It may be um, like long histories of, of mistrust of an institution um, or, uh, you know, um, where people don't want to come in even if it's free, for example. Um, and then I think we really have a uh, unfortunate history of relying on trainees um, from minoritized backgrounds to um, to diversify um, our cohort. Um, and, and I think um, that needs to stop. Um, it, 
it's uh, totally inappropriate. We can go into more details about that later. Um, I love to highlight this study by Carrie Gleason, um, who, um, who looked at the NAC data set, which um, everyone here has access to, um, and basically um, compared the um, rate of decline of Black people in that cohort um, with white people in that cohort and found that the Black people who are enrolled in NAC don't have as rapid decline if they have MCI as the white people with um, MCI. So you could use those data to conclude that, you know, um, there's something, you know, about race that makes it so that, you know, if, if you have MCI, you don't, you don't have a, a as high risk of decline or conversion or progression to Alzheimer's disease. Um, or you could look at it the way that Carrie did, which is that to recognize that the Black people in that data set are completely different, a completely different subset of, of, of people than the white people in that data set. In other words, after she took um, into account um, um, uh, uh, ascertainment um, or enrollment, um, uh, uh, differences in enrollment across race, uh, there was no difference in rates of decline across race. Um, so uh, a lot of the you know, racial differences that we're seeing in studies of cognitive function um, are, are maybe uh, related to, um, or, or even lack of difference um, between racial and ethnic groups um, in our studies, maybe due to the bias that is embedded in um, differential enrollment. Um, and I think Casey Dieter's uh, paper in the A4 um, trial really uh, exemplifies this. This is actually from the supplement of her paper. So you wanna look that up and check out the supplement. Um, um, essentially, um, you know, CDR scores above zero and having a low mini mental uh, and logical memory scores were the primary reason why non-white participants were excluded from the A4 trial at the initial screening. Um, but then as soon as people got excluded from that, that screen, they weren't followed up um, anymore. So now we can't determine whether uh, the ethnic and racial differences in like whether people were screen, screen fails at that first um, initial screen was the product of what we all know about the logical memory and the mini mentals that the racial bi biases in those measures, um, or whether there really are population differences in burden of cognitive impairment. Um, in the end, uh, the, the black and, um, and Latinx and Asian people who were um, included, who, who passed the screen, and advanced to the amyloid PET imaging screenings. Remember this trial was um, for, for an amyloid reducing drug. So you needed to be amyloid positive. Um, if you get to um, pass that first screen, which is where you have to have um, uh, uh, normal memory, then you get to a, a, a second screen and you need to be amyloid positive. Well, the subgroup of participants who advanced to that PET imaging screen among the non-white participants, they were much less likely to meet eligibility criteria or much less like to, likely to, to be amyloid positive. Um, um, so, I mean, I think, again, we're sort of at a loss to understand why that is um, and whether the results from the A4 trial are representative at all um, of black people, uh, Asian people, or um, uh, Hispanic people who, um, you know, might have, who, who uh, um, you know, underwent this um, amyloid reducing drug. Uh, another really good example of this type of selection bias that I think is totally relevant for neuropsychology is, um, is this study that just came out from um, Melinda Powers group. This is Khan Giantazio, who um, compared associations across ADNI and Eric, Eric is a community-based cohort and ADNI is not. Um, and what she found that was that um, a substantial uh, number of associations between sociodemographic variables and sort of brain health outcomes 
differed, including the ones shown here in this imaging subsample. So amyloid burden had a much stronger relationship to cognitive outcomes in Abney um, than in Eric. And race had a smaller effect on Abney um, than in um, Eric. And the E4 allele, the apple E4 allele, had a weaker relationship to amyloid burden in Eric, in the community-based cohort, than it did in Abney. Um, so, I mean, it, it sort of, you know, leads to this kind of um, important thing that we're missing. I think if we don't um, define who our target is and who we want to get in our studies and then, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, use community-based um, um, methods uh, is that the inferences that we, that we reach based on these highly selected clinical samples may not be relevant to the broader population. And it, for neuropsychology, I think it kind of blows my mind to think about all the literature that we based our um, field on that comes from these highly selected samples. Um, another example from, um, uh, from the Alzheimer's disease world, um, several studies, not just this one, um, have shown that uh, Black people, Black older adults um, have less tau than, um, uh, than white people. Um, this is just one example of that study. On the left side of the graph, they're showing that the Black people who participated in this um, AD biomarker study um, had no different amyloid um, uh, levels than the white people in the study. Um, we actually found something different in YCAP. This is Adam Brickman's um, study where he showed that in a community-based cohort in Northern Manhattan, the levels of amyloid and tau were not reliably different across race or ethnicity. Um, the biomarker that best distinguished um, between those who had a clinical diagnosis of AD versus normal cognition was P-tau, uh, 217. Um, this was more true in white people and black people, but not so much in the Latinx um, older adults in our study. Um, so um, we, we do think that plasma biomarkers are a critical component of understanding um, the burden of neuropathology in disparities populations, but we, again, we need to um, take advantage of some of these plasma available markers to, um, to um, include more representative populations. Okay, so I kind of showed you uh, some of the challenges that we've um, faced in doing population neuropsychology or community-centered neuropsychology. Um, and I just want to kind of harp or, uh, you know, uh, I want to um, emphasize two main directions that I think we can go to, um, to, uh, uh, to move toward a more uh, community-centered neuropsychology. And the first thing that we need to do is um, just change our, the culture of our, of our field. It's easy, let's just snap our fingers and we'll change the culture of our field. Um, I think we need to um, think more carefully about the, the people who are doing neuropsychology, where they're from, uh, what privileges they have and um, how we're going to uh, make that make make so the practitioners um, and the people who were welcomed and trained into our field um, uh, more representative uh, and and in embedded in that I think is changing the places where we um, where we make um, training offered if we're uh, only located in primarily white um, institutions we are not going to um, change the face and the experience and the depth and the breadth of our field. Um, I think that we also need to challenge every single uh, use of race and ethnicity in neuropsych papers. We need to make um, authors explain why they're using race and ethnicity. What is it, um, if, it if it's here as a proxy, what, what do you think it's a proxy for? Um, and really um, like explain out exactly what what the what the the, the research questions are, um, uh, and then um, I've kind of high you know in my previous part of my talk kind of um, you know highlighted why 
uh, we need at a minimum representative research studies uh, for all of the, the uh, um, brain um, behavior relationships that we study, um, you know, regardless of age, um, that in order to answer any questions that are about disparities, um, not every paper is a disparities paper, not every question is a, is a disparities question, but at least we can make um, these, um, we can make our samples representative. Um, but if we do have a disparities question, we need to oversample um, populations that are um, traditionally excluded from research in order to answer those questions with enough power. Um, we've got to recognize that uh, you know, collection of norms um, in Jacksonville or San Diego among Black people is absolutely not sufficient for Black people all around the country. Um, and so place has a, there is an incredible um, interaction with, um, you know, uh, some of the other, you know, their socio-demographic variables that neuropsychologists are interested in. And we, we rarely ever think about that. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think that in order to do this kind of research, um, we're gonna have to lead with the assumption uh, and the acceptance that um, there's a lot of, of uh, repairing to do uh, of relationships of, um, you know, of functions of, of neighborhoods and systems. And so we need to invest in the communities that we're interested in doing research with um, and, and support um, unmet needs. And, you know, we can be very specific about what, about what those needs are, um, but we have to remain, um, you know, good listeners about, about what, what they might be in each, in each community. And I think that when we conduct community-based um, research, we really, um, start to get a window into the most important drivers of brain health. And I just wanna review a little bit of research. I've shown it before, so I'm gonna probably fly through it um, a bit and then we'll kind of get to the Q&A. But um, uh, you know, community-based methods uh, in neuropsychology have shown me how incredibly important um, cerebrovascular disease is to um, to maintaining brain health as um, we get older. So I'm showing you some white matter hyperintensities that Adam Brickman um, uh, has, has quantified in his lab. Um, he's a really good um, and close um, collaborator and colleague of mine. Um, and then Laura Zahadny showed that um, these white matter hyperintensities were really closely tied to cognition in African-American older adults but not in the non-Hispanic white older adults in the YCAP study. Um, we are uh, collecting information from the adult um, children of the YCAP cohort who are all Medicare eligible older adults who live in the neighborhoods of Northern Manhattan. And so we have this parent generation and this offspring generation and Indira Turney has um, documented um, now this really shocking um, disparity in the offspring who are in the red here. Um, I mean, you know, you're, we're not born with white matter hyperintensity, so, um, you know, we have to get them as we get older. Um, and we hope that in, in middle age, um, we don't have many, but it looks like, um, you know, when we compare the parent generation and the offspring generation, the uh, burden of white matter hyperintensities in the black and Latinx um, participants are already um, almost as high as they are in their um, parents who are you know, 20, 25 years older. Um, the mean age of the offspring here is about 55 years um, at the time of scan and the mean age of the parents at time of scan is about 76 years old. Um, so that's, um, you know, uh, another one of those other um, kind of shockers that, um, you know, bring out the importance of, of cerebrovascular disease to me. Um, the other thing that I think, um, you know, community-based research kind of shows you is the um, power of, um, of uh, early life um, social conditions. Okay, so, I mean, I think I, I kind of, 
you know, led this part of the, the talk with one of the mediators, I think some of the mediators between early life and later life brain health um, are cardiovascular or cerebrovascular disease. But, um, but, but let's talk about some of the fundamental drivers um, which are um, social conditions early in life and throughout life. Um, and it's really hard to, you know, and when you're doing research, it's really hard to separate the, um, you know, the, the racial classification from the social um, and, you know, racially patterned um, social and um, uh, um, economic um, factors that drive uh, racial differences in health um, and racism itself. So I love this paper that I'm about to show you, which came out of Cuba. Um, this is Jorge Libre Guerra and brilliant. Okay, they did a population-based sample of um, people in Cuba. Um, in Cuba, among this generation of older adults, they have equal access to healthcare, similar levels of education across race, race and racial um, uh, self-identification, um, similar levels of education and similar socioeconomic status. And after they um, did that, they found no differences in dementia prevalence or cognitive test performance among the, the groups that they um, uh, had classified in Cuba, white, black, and mestizos in Cuba. The, the graph I'm showing you here, or the figure I'm showing you here from the paper, look it up, is that they found that um, people who had higher African ancestry in Cuba did have lower cognitive test performance, but once they um, control for social mediated variables like education and SES, African ancestral proportion was not associated with any um, uh, overall cognitive test performance. So I love this because they're starting to be able, they're using the cross um, national context to really distinguish uh, some of these assumptions that we have about, about black race um, in, in different cultural contexts. So um, I thought that was a, a, a huge um, uh, contribution. And then um, another new study, a relatively new study was by Michelle Conca who looked at racial residential segregation and cognitive function in the CARDIA study. And this is, a, um, it looks complicated um, or fancy, it is. It's a directed um, acyclic graph um, and it's showing the time varying confounding of where people live or the, um, you know, the residential segregation of, their, of where they live um, um, and cognitive function. Um, and basically what Dr. Kanka found is that greater cumulative exposure to segregation, to living in a segregated neighborhood was associated with worse digit symbol scores um, uh, relative to people who, were, who lived in low segregation neighborhoods. Um, and again, I mean, this study, you, you can't do this study um, with a, uh, you know, without a community-based cohort. This CARDIA study recruited people from uh, various cities all over the country and were followed longitudinally over many years. So, um, you know, I, I think that this is super innovative and it's using essentially, um, you know, uh, this, this uh, special um, kind of analysis, um, marginal structural models that are weighted um, using inverse probability weighting to account for the confounding of the fact that, um, you know, their, their individual, um, individual SES is completely confounded with neighborhood level um, SES, neighborhood um, level socioeconomic um, uh, and, and residential segregation. So I think that also kind of highlights when you when you when you use community-based um, methods and when you seek representative cohorts, you start to understand the importance of place. And this is such a great study by Maria Limor, who really showed this um, racial and um, area-level patterning 
of um, Alzheimer's disease, where people who were born and raised in the stroke belt, even if they moved out of the stroke belt, were at higher risk of dying with Alzheimer's disease on their, on their, on their death certificate. And then in the candle study, Paula Gilsands really showed this of people who just live in Northern California. They lived there for over 25 years. Um, um, and they were, they work there, they raise their families there, they have Kaiser insurance. And then um, she showed that if they were born in a high stroke mortality state, they were more likely to be diagnosed with dementia as older adults, um, even if though they moved out of those stroke belt states. So there's something going on with place um, that um, is incredibly important um, that I think some of the, uh, that neuropsychologists um, need to pay more attention to. Um, and then I think I'll, I'll end here with sort of my favorite topic, which is um, education and educational quality and educational policy. Um, you know, this study is from Europe um, where they took um, older adults uh, from different panels, so different age cohorts um, uh, and recruited them in longitudinal research. Uh, it's the SHARE study which is a sister study of the health and retirement survey. Um, and they showed that people who were um, subject to uh, educational compulsory, compulsory school laws where the number of years of education um, increased, they, they raised the minimum age of leaving school. And as a result, um, measures of executive function um, really improved at, um, in people who were subject to those laws um, as older adults. I hope that makes sense, sense to everybody. Um, let me show Yet Vaughn's study in our uh, YCAP cohort where we really did very similar thing, uh, comparing people um, who were born earlier uh, before 1920 versus people who were born later. Um, we studied them at the exact same age. They all lived in the exact same neighborhood. They were all given the exact same test. They were all followed over the exact same amount of time. And people who were born later um, had less decline on their uh, memory than people who were born earlier. Uh, you probably have heard a lot about these, um, you know, sort of secular or cohort um, differences in risk for dementia, but this really um, in the YCAP cohort was related to changes in educational policy in the states um, where these people were born and raised. And that's what accounted for these um, uh, sort of secular um, differences. So, um, Here's what we do in our, in our studies. Um, I'm involved in um, a, a number of them, uh, but in YCAP and Offspring and Regards, we oversample people who've been traditionally excluded. Um, everything is, um, of, and everyone is available um, in Spanish and English. Um, the uh, process of you know, determining capacity to consent creates a discussion about what research is all about. Um, a discussion that people share with their families, and then we can conduct family studies, um, sort of intergenerational studies. We offer in-home evaluation to everyone. Um, we do give some routine feedback, particularly when there's an emergency situation, which we often find someone is in at home. Um, we also, for the offspring study, have um, hired on a bilingual social worker who um, works with our um, with with our um, with our participants on um, a number of needs. There's a lot of people who don't have any health insurance. She gets it for them. There's people who need food stamps. She helps. She walks them through those steps. There's people who um, are couch surfing and essentially homeless. She helps them find an apartment. It's um, a lot. Um, and uh, that's that's what it is to do um, research in um, communities that are the real deal, not just the people who already have access. Um, and we refer people to to doc we get them doctors, we refer people to um, specialists, and so on. Um, when we're you know this is these are results from the regard study that essentially we found that um, you know these early life investments in school lowered risk of cognitive impairment later in life, the effect was strongest in white people, especially white women. So um, here is, um, you know, just an example 
of how, um, you know, you, you need a lot of people, like 20,000 people were included in this cohort, but you need a lot of people to find some of these interactions and you need to use this um, kind of approach of intersectionality because especially in black people and especially in black men, um, the effect of having a higher quality school um, uh, you know, did not have the same returns to um, you know, cognition as among white people and especially white women. And we think that racism in schools and the labor market really served to counteract those um, benefits of, of school quality, particularly for, for black men. Um, this is Project Talent where, um, you know, and I wanna just make neuropsychologists aware of all these really cool cohorts that are becoming available. There's Project Talent, there's High School and Beyond, there's Ad Health, um, there's um, the ABCD study, um, oops, which, uh-oh, I was going forward, let me go backwards, that um, are school-based cohorts. And um, what you can really do there is um, cluster people by school and understand the differential effects of school, uh, you know, um, school resources and school investment on, on, each, in, on each person. And Project Talent was a high school study in 1960, so now they're in their 70s and we tracked um, a bunch of them down. And oh my God, I'm going the wrong way, crazy. Um, Nika Sedlova did this research and she found, um, she, she created a composite of school quality indicators, um, including term length, class size, and math and science courses. And um, uh, you can see that the lowest um, school quality was experienced by, by black people, or, or um, you know, I'll tell you that they did. In the smaller, um, subset of, of Project Talent um, participants where we had, um, where we had uh, cognitive testing over the phone, um, people who attended higher quality schools had better cognitive test scores. But when you break it down by race and ethnicity, this effect is largely driven by the white people. It doesn't hold up as much among the black people such that um, higher school quality is not associated with better test scores among black people. Okay, so let me, um, sum up. This is my second to last slide. Um, I don't think we need any more neuropsych research using convenience samples. I really don't. I, I, I would love to have this discussion um, afterwards. Where is it appropriate for us to have, um, uh, you know, highly selected homogeneous convenience samples to answer any question about how the brain works um, anymore. Um, so maybe someone has some ideas that, that I'm, I'm missing. Um, we really, as neuropsychologists, need to define our target population or who we want our results to apply to because that will, should define the design of our research and of, our, of, our, of, our, of, our, uh, of everything that we do. We need to be able to measure um, contextual factors well um, and well enough to determine their um, contribution. I mean, I've heard tell of some instances where, you know, the, the sort of longer um, existing Alzheimer's disease um, research groups feel uh, that they don't want to include measures of discrimination. Um, in their batteries because it might offend some of the participants. Um, you know, I think that if we don't ask about experiences of discrimination, if we let our own, um, if we let our own um, hesitations and, and fears get in the way, and we don't kind of, you know, uh, collaborate with investigators who've been doing this for a very long time, uh, very well, then we'll continue to um, miss a lot of the really important contextual factors that drive um, the uh, drive brain health. And then um, I also think equally that we should be including, um, uh, you know, biomarkers of neuropathology that are population feasible. We use MRI. Um, that's not as um, great as some of the plasma biomarkers that are coming on the scene because you actually have to get to an MRI center um, uh, 
and you have to fit into the MRI and that's, that's a thing. Um, but um, we, have been, we have been doing um, some of that stuff. Somebody's going into a closet behind me, hold on. Um, okay, so let me go to my last slide, um, which is some of the next steps. Uh, we need to embrace um, the fact that maybe some of our, um, maybe some of our, um, our, our policy changes are going to work on where people um, uh, you know, the, the cognitive ability that people enter adulthood or enter older age with, and that we're, we may not be working as hard on the, um, on, on affecting slope or change over time. Um, this is particularly useful for the people who are looking at older adults, but I love any policy change that will raise level of cognition um, as people enter old age, that's good. You don't necessarily need to work on slope um, or work on um, you know, preventing um, decline over time. That's harder, um, but let's, let's give people advantages um, as they enter. I think neuropsychologists um, need to learn more about harmonized measures um, uh, for uh, across studies and across centers for accelerating um, our ability to learn new things and create maybe synthetic cohorts that will help us answer questions um, about uh, you know, different um, levels or different levels of analysis, different levels of diversity. Um, I think um, many of us are uh, uh, you know, hooked into this idea that uh, lifestyle choices determine um, you know, brain health. They're really, um, if, if you have a population representative cohort, you'll see that policies are actually the, the um, main driver of some of these disparities um, in health. And um, it's not, uh, you know, it's important to identify those, um, those factors and, and work on those factors and invest in those um, inequalities in schools and teachers and neighborhoods and, um, you know, in, invest in, um, uh, you know, policies that will um, repair some of the inequalities that have occurred due to racism and discrimination and wealth. Um, and then finally, I'm looking forward to continuing what I'm seeing happening in the field, uh, critical leadership by scientists who have not traditionally been included in, in dementia research. I think that's important for us to, to really grow our, our science. Thank you. As always, thank you so much. I think this was wonderful, and we have so many questions in the chat. Oh, really? Uh, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll be I'll be brief. Then I'll try to get to all of them. <laughs> there's um there's a few of them that um kind of have overlapping uh, themes. Um, you know, one of them is in terms of you know these community based samples and the recruitment. What were some of those barriers that your team had to overcome? Um, as well as how do people go about? you know, uh, recruiting aging and minority populations, particularly when it comes to longitudinal studies? Yeah, if, if your um, group has never done it before, I would say don't do it. Um, you know, I, I think that if, um, you know, recruitment is the very last step in a whole, you know, uh, bunch of years of work in the community, and recruitment is the very last thing that you do. I really like to tell the story of, of, um, of Milwaukee, um, this ADRC that is actually centered in, um, in Madison. They didn't have any black people. So um, they partnered with a group of um, sort of health um, uh, community workers in Milwaukee, which is largely black um, place in um, Wisconsin. And, um, they, um, they didn't recruit anyone for eight years. They just invested in the community for, for eight years and learned about what some of the issues were and how, um, and kind of made themselves known and made themselves known as um, people who um, could provide services. And uh, that's a long time. 
that's mm -hmm. way too long for like a first year grad student to make changes in a place that's never done it before. So I know that's not like a super satisfying answer for anybody, but it's the truth. Yeah, and you know, and I think we have generally here this mentality, if you build it, they'll come, right? And I think that kind of mentality in healthcare and academia and research is very flawed, right? Because time after time, we're understanding that, you know, it's more than just advertising that you're providing these services, but it's also understanding what the community need rather than telling what the community needs, right? And I think- yeah as neuropsychologists and just people in healthcare, we think even those of us who were born in those, born and raised in those communities and went on to get these, um, you know, educational degrees, we haven't come, we haven't gone back. So the needs mm -hmm. might have changed, right? And I think one of the things that was very, uh, for me was just this kind of lifespan as you're presenting all these papers and these early experiences and how they're affecting and impacting later age, but as neuropsychologists, we're either, we're either, you know, in aging and older adults or pediatrics. And I feel like there's no crosstalk mm. about this whole lifespan approach, but the research you're showing. Yeah, actually. And I'm, I'm, I actually, um, you know, am, am probably one of the people who have, um, you know, committed that, that, um, you know, that, that lack of communication. The only thing I can say for myself is that at, because I you know, studied you know, representative populations of older adults and kind of got a window into uh, what some of the drivers were of their, you know, of their later life cognition being early life experiences, I then kind of got in with this whole education crowd, um, people who had been you know, running these longitudinal panel studies like Project Talent and OS72 and, and High School and Beyond, um, it's not this, they're not, you know, pediatric neuropsychologists by any means. They're not, um, you know, child experts, they're education experts. Um, so at least I'm sort of building the, the interdisciplinary, um, you know, approach to it that way. But I, I totally agree with what you're saying that we need to think about this and communicate with each other. Yeah, sure. Um, there was another um, um, comment about, you know, what is the, it, it seems like the next logical step is to influence policy to address these disparities. And, you know, I know that you have uh, in terms of the NIH and even Congress, uh, how can we do that? I feel like, you know, as a trainee, and I, I feel like I share this with a lot of trainees, our papers never leave PubMed, you know, uh, we're kind of always publishing, but how can we as a field move forward in terms of making sure that our research is, is being, is influencing policy changes to address these disparities? Yeah, that's a good question. I still haven't got all the answers there. I think um, it is the case that, um, you know, I've been, um, you know, involved in, um, you know, making more funds available uh, for uh, disparities research um, in my area uh, by making the case sort of similar case to what I made today. Um, uh, you know, to, to that extent, um, perhaps, you know, the amount of investment that there is for services and for for research, uh, you know, and for prevention of um, you know brain dysfunction in populations that are already experiencing um, many disparities in those areas. That that's kind of where I've kind of blended this scientific expertise with um, with it. I, I think we probably all, as um, neuropsychologists, need training and advocacy. Um, you know, I know, Annie, you're involved in like epilepsy associations, I'm involved in the Alzheimer's Association, all of that is, is probably attainable for us, um, you know, as neuropsychologists, we should be involved in patient advocacy groups, and, and helping make a voice for more diverse people in those groups, within those groups. Um, 
And, uh, you know, I, I think part of that is like, does the Epilepsy Association, I'm probably giving it the wrong name, does the Alzheimer's Association have Spanish speaking staff? Like, are there, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's really simple and it can be, um, it can be, uh, it can be, uh, you know, really simple, but it's, it's not an easy um, ask sometimes. Yeah, and I think to that point, I think the field and, and how students and trainees are being evaluated, even early career in neuropsychologists, making sure that we're taking advocacy into account, right? That it's not just the publications, it's not just the awards, but all this other work, you know, I, I think about so many people and so many trainees doing advocacy work um, and the importance of that. But I think the field has to shift and understand that moving forward, you know, this is part of a solution at least. Yeah. I mean, I think we advocate for ourselves as cultural neuropsychologists. We're getting better at that. I think we advocate for ourselves as neuropsychologists within the field, within our departments, you know, from within, uh, you know, that smaller world. But, but we're not always involved in advocating for our patients and our participants beyond what we would do like in a report where we're obviously, you know, like trying to advocate for the family and advocate for the, for the patient. Um, when I talk about advocacy, um, you know, I am talking about that broader sort of communication of our results back to the community. And part of that is starting with the community before you even start to ask your questions. Um, if you do that, then, you know, that, that feedback loop is natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was one question that has, uh, as we're kind of a topic of trainees, that pertains to training. Um, and it's what barriers do you see cur that currently exist to increasing your psych training, uh, primarily non, uh, non primarily white institutions. Um, so I'm assuming HBCUs, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges, and what might be ways um, to partner and support neuropsych training at these institutions? Yeah, I think, um you know, there, there's no easy answer to that. I think there are some, um, you know, I think there are some uh, windows into how we can do that. Um, you know, for example, um, over the summer, uh, I uh, mentored a number of um, undergrads who attend um, primarily minority serving institutions uh, for a sort of a, a, a 10 week um, period of time through a, a summer mentoring program. And many of those people um, who are undergrads at institutions that is not Columbia University, um, you know, want to go into neuropsychology. So they're beginning their relationship with me. I think um, we need to put ourselves out there and, and, help, and, and make ourselves available for those types of, of opportunities. Um, you know, I think that we need to, um, make it, um, you know, the infrastructure support that kind of thing. So those students were paid um, to come out to New York City and to live um, out here and to, um, you know, paid a, a whole system of, uh, you know, folks who were going to help them, um, you know, with this summer program. There are a number of those types of programs out there. Um, but I think um, neuropsychology hasn't necessarily been traditionally involved in them. They may, may be geared more toward, you know, medical school or, you know, neuroscience per se, and not yeah. necessarily neuropsychology. We got to, we got to wedge our way in there and yeah. get those people. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, we're, we're past the hour. So I'll just end with this. I think yeah. we could learn a lot from the neuroscience field and their recruitment and retention of students and the fact that there is NIH funding that will fund programs like this. And I think mm -hmm. neuropsychologists um, could really, you know, utilize this kind of platform and, and, and pipeline that neuroscience have. Um, Maybe you should have a no neuropsychology just about the funding opportunities. Yeah, we okay. definitely, we should definitely. Thank you so much, Dr. Manley. It's always an honor to have you. Uh, and thank you for everyone watching. This uh, lecture recording will be up uh, by the end of the week.